I mean, we were, you know, doing this rehearsal of sound till seven o'clock in the morning, and uh, 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 we just couldn't come. The others couldn't come. The others went to sleep, and you know, things are not on. Uh, <laughs> So if you've got burning questions at any moment, just feel free to intervene. Well, we're just pretending to be the democratic here. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously this is completely to tell us our end, but not that any way, so in the West, we something. imagine some completely dystopian, nightmarish, massive industrial complex on the scale of live ice music. And of course, the, the Tobolia has the highest chimney in Europe, so it is very impressive, but actually Tobolia is... The highest concrete structure. The highest concrete structure. Tobolia is actually, uh, when you go there, is actually smaller than you imagine. And one of the reasons for that is Leibach so mythologized it and built up this image of this nightmarish industrial city which somebody might have imagined <coughs> occupying several kilometers. <laughs> Interesting for is that you actually as Lyot members, you had experience of the industry. You even yeah. worked in the factories. So well, for yeah. some periods, yeah. you came from industrial families. Yes. And that's a huge difference between you and the Western, or most of the Western industrial groups. You actually have that like test daily board. industrial experience. Like test board. And uh, <laughs> that's what we did. You know, we were, we were working in different factories. Uh, and uh, <coughs> you get, you seriously get you know, a different idea of the of the when the yeah. I worked I worked in a cement factory for instance. And it was, you know, kind of pleasure because we were trying ourselves in this huge piles of uh, cement, you know. Uh, it's a real good thing. It's good for skin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like powder. <clears throat> and now they want to close down this cement factory because it's, you know. And we were attacked because we didn't want to support this uh, eco guys. I mean, there would be no Leibach without the cement factory. Yeah, and the other, the other very important aspect of uh, uh, working in factories is that you start to understand the, uh, the repetition, which is obviously very important generally in life and also in Leibach's music. Repetition and uh, also, yeah, the mo monotony of the, you know, the working process of the uh, uh, basically sound and so on. And this was the basis of, of live music. I mean, you know, <coughs> punks were saying enough is to play those three chords. We didn't know those three chords. <laughs> uh, so we started to, to actually to create so-called concrete music, uh, music which was uh, inspired by concrete sounds. And we never, treat, we never understood what we were doing as music, really, because it's kind of pretentious. It was more, you know, concrete industry made by, you know, instruments, which were not even regular instruments because we had to, you know, some of them were, were produced by ourselves. And I must say <coughs> proudly that we were probably one of the first groups uh, who were using a record player as an instrument. Uh, not because we wanted to be the first DJs, you know, whatever, simply because that was the most the easiest way how to produce sound, how to make sound. If you didn't have a, a, a keyboard, I mean a, a synth or something, you know, we, uh, we simply took the record player and records, we kind of scratched them a little bit, you know, put them, put them on the 16 speed. And that, that was it. And we put a tape on the record, which later on we figured out that everybody else was doing that as well which is kind of similar process to cut up. And we got the repetitive monotony, uh, very interesting sounds, so completely something else from what the original uh, record was, which is another proof that something might sound, <coughs> something which sounds like, you know, which actually sounds <laughs> like Queen can also, can, can also sound like Leiber, mm -hmm. if you turn it. The other important aspect for us was, of course, ideology, and still is. And uh, in its very rough, basic, simple uh, 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 points, you know, you, there's, there was lots of uh, ideology in Tobolia because, and socialism, and, you know, everywhere, capitalism, whatever, but we didn't know yet about capitalism, except from uh, news. Uh, so, uh, ideology was also incredibly important, and, you know, there, there was a 
Trabori was packed with these revolutionary choirs and you know history. The first female strike in Yugoslavia, the first I don't know male strike, lot, lots of strikes, socialist strike, uh, the election of the, the Communist Party of Slovenia in some. This was all. These, these were all kind of mythic, mythic, very mythic stories for us. Uh, Communist Party was uh, created in some small cabin lock in the, you know in the up in the mountains around Trboli and these are kind of mythic stories. And uh, when you start to understand them, of course, they influence you. And, uh, and we start to realize that, you know, on one hand, of course, cultural life, uh, industrial life, family life, and, you know, ideology and politics, everything is connected. So that's what actually made life a bit different. woke up in the morning and went down there. The valley, you know, the, the Tbolia, the city. I've seen these posters, you know, cross, live, whatever, everywhere, and and, uh, and you know, these ex expressionist uh, uh, graphics, and that was a real, really, really shock. You know? And that was a, that was actually kind of an environmental action in itself, good enough to, if anything, if nothing else would happen. I mean, only that was really already, you know. Interesting and reassuring is that the posters went up again, yeah. and again people tore them down. So even after the three decades, people were still <coughs> there are still people in Tbilisi who are scandalised or antagonised. Yeah, you know, we, we don't get any wiser. I mean, people generally we don't mm. we don't really change. It. With me after I left the army, some clothes, some you know, shirts and for the group to, to to get the first uniforms <laughs> and some. Bombs, uh, not the real bombs, uh, smoke bombs, because there was no uh, effects, no no hazer, no nothing. So we we use those smoke bombs uh, at, the, at the concert, and the audience were trying, they were trying to escape. <laughs> you couldn't see the group, you know, you just you could just hear some noise. You know, I, I always understood uh, rock groups as a kind of uh, military formation. Finally, they're coming out from the military formation. I mean brass bands. Mm -hmm. Rock group is just a smaller, more economical uh, form of brass band. Basically, you had brass bands, which was a typical uh, military formation. Then you had a jazz band, which was a kind of <coughs> pretending to be something more than brass band, which was still a brass band, a smaller <laughs> version. And then you had the popular version of jazz band, which was, you know, rock and roll. And they actually, you know, they all dressed in uniforms. I mean, they all have long hair, I don't know, Jeans, you know, all kinds of Beatles were dressed in uniforms. Rolling Stones, everybody. It's it's a military formation. Rock rock group is a military formation trying to actually act forcefully towards the audience, you know, uh, persuading them that you know they know something which they don't, and maybe they can serve, they can kind of serve them this in in a in a way that audience might even enjoy. But basically, they're selling them ideology, you know, which is of course. Uh, subordinating the audience to the, so that they go in the shop and buy the rare. Uh, no, we were all working together basically, and Tomas was of course uh, uh, a very important part. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it was really impressive. I mean, he did this one show which was you know good enough for for everything else. I mean, for the rest of not not his life, but uh, it's. Uh, it's hard to talk about him. It's, this year is going to be 30, 30 anniversary of his death. Yeah. 21st of December, by the way, end of the year. <laughs> he has chosen a, a nice day. Well, it's, you know, the old members, new members, whatever, you know. It's, we've said it very clearly. Lava is a kind of machine which, you know, kind of eats people alive. We've used all kinds of languages. I mean, even if we, you know, if we sing, if we do songs in Slovenian or French or whatever, they will always say, oh, they speak German. Mm -hmm. Because German is, you know, usually the language, no, you know, the other guys don't, the audience that does not understand. And uh, actually, German, Nemec, in Slovenian means uh, mute. Means mute. And, uh, and uh, in, in, uh, from Slovenian explanation of the, of the wor word, German, name it, yes, mute, is actually the guy who is not able to speak because you don't understand him, he's not able to talk, you know. And sl 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 Slavic people, Slavs, mm -hmm. Slovani, it actually comes out from the word Slovo, 
which means you know talk uh, formulate so we can speak the in the, the country <laughs> we, we, we did this you know English uh, songs and so on and then they, they saw uh, Leibach uh, doing the German songs and said yeah why not you know if, if they can do it we, maybe we should do it too yeah. and uh, and that's it you know Ramstein I actually uh, not talking about you know the taste or style here, but in fact what they are, uh, what they are making, what they are producing, is uh, in fact uh, you know this proudness of being German again. I mean speaking German language. Uh, you know, Croatian communists were getting completely crazy about as they said, you know, it's like too much, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and they actually said to Slovenian communists, you know, you have to do something with them, you know. And and then they created this idea of let's expose them to, to, to the public. Let's put them on the national TV. And they will, you know, the, the people will, uh, will kind of... Uh, uh, take action. Take action, yes. Uh, and, you know, we were partly naive, but partly also we thought, you know, this is a good chance, you know, it's a good PR, and, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. Let's do the interview, and uh, we even help them. We, we knew that you know it's, they are going to show us it as a, easily. Uh, they could easily uh, kill Leibach at that moment if they would actually show the entire footage, the way we were recording that uh, TV interview, because we were laughing all the time. <laughs> you know, we did the uh, the answer. We've got the question. We did the answer. You know, let's let's read this answer. Okay. And then we were laughing seriously because it was for us it was a dadaistic uh, uh, experience. And if they would really shot that things, how we were, how we were not truly what you know yeah. they wanted us to be, yeah, it would be the end on the, the other side. Actually, you know, all these songs really have uh, multiple uh, uh, layers and uh, and meanings, and you you just have to turn it a little bit around, and it actually shows maybe its true side. I don't know, or its false side or something. I don't know. But this is what we're doing. You know, we're kind of checking if, if there's anything else there, or just the self reaction was. If pe people were pretty much in, in shock, the audience was in shock, and they didn't really know what to do with us. Firstly, because you know they created their own myth of ourselves, coming from the east behind the you know, uh, Iron Curtain, and they wanted Would to see it. Would be possible to say that uh, it was more difficult for punk in England than it was for Leibach and NSK in Yugoslavia, even though the prejudices always point to the other way. You know, I really could see it happened. A lot, a lot of things happened in England at the time. I mean, you had some, you know, best-selling punk groups. They, they turned upside down the logic of the uh, music industry. They actually created. They were the forefront of the uh, so-called independent, uh, independent uh, labels. Independent labels were created by the, the whole punk uh, uh, thing, and uh, it, it was a boost. It was a kind of boost to the music industry. It was exactly what market needed. A new idea, you know, how to sell things, and punk was uh, perfect. Uh, the, the scene was also taken more, was more seriously. Music in the 80s, and it also made impact, ideological impact. It wasn't just, you know, a youth culture. We were combining musicians, people who knew how to do the stuff, and we kind of put them together pretty much as an instrument. We said we're going to use you know this guitarist and this piano player and you know these guys and this this was our composition. We used we didn't abuse them, we used people, musicians. <laughs> to do the music which would fit you know our standards, I mean our demands. They can do it, you know, it's be fun. <laughs> but we had the good ideas, which was also important. And it's, you know, first music is, you know, I mean, not, we are not obsessed by music, but yeah, music is everywhere. And every genre of music is uh, uh, equally important and relevant and interesting, and it can be a source of inspiration. And if you mix the two opposite genres together, well, you can get a really nice result. It's like cooking, basically. Perfect. Segue into lunch.